Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Jason Garbus. He's the Chief Product Officer for AppGate. Jason, good to have you with us today. Great to be here, Tom, thanks. And our topic is zero trust. And of course, zero trust is on a lot of lips of many federal agencies. Certainly the White House has mandated zero trust in some form or another in the executive order on cybersecurity, which came out earlier in the spring. So let's start with a little definition of terms from AppGate's standpoint. When we talk about zero trust, what do you mean by it? So zero trust, it can mean a lot of things. And I'm glad that we're, I'm glad we're starting with this. Um, so zero trust is really a security philosophy and approach that's uh, built on a few core principles. So number one, ensuring that all access for all users is secured and managed and driven by a set of dynamic and context sensitive access policies. Um, number two, um, zero trust requires that organizations have a strong uh, identity system um, and a clear picture of the types of resources that users need to access. Uh, and number three, that organizations monitor and manage all access for users. So if you take all those things together and you build upon the foundations that we have in place around uh, security best practices and approaches, identity management, endpoint management, things like that, you end up with a really rich view of how organizations should approach security uh, that lends itself really well to a variety of different architectures. So that's kind of a lot, and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of activity going on, especially in the federal government, around putting some clarity for this and defining how, uh, how federal agencies should use and implement different architectures. And you mentioned a lot of element, a dynamic and context uh, sensitive access policy, strong ID system, monitoring and reporting to, to management and to the IT staff. How do you integrate all of this? It sounds like a lot to bring in, easy to say, but hard to turn into something. Yes, and that's one of the reasons that the key, one of the key requirements for zero trust systems uh, as federal agencies and even, even private sector agencies look at implementing this is how can it be integrated into existing elements of their IT and security infrastructure. I think that organizations need to look at what are both the, the inbound and the outbound APIs, what's the event model that allows these systems to be very, in a very short, straightforward and meaningful way, tied into their existing infrastructure. And some of this is very, very straightforward and there's great uh, widely adopted industry standards around this, like identity management and authentication. Right? There's LDAP, which is a little bit old, but still in wide use. There's newer authentication standards like SAML and OpenID Connect. And all of those make for very, very easy for organizations to take their enterprise identity management system and have their users authenticate into that through a zero trust system. There's other areas that are not yet standardized. So things like, I'll give you a great example, integrating with a help desk. In many cases, uh, organizations want to control access to resources based on the existence or status of a help desk ticket. That's a business process. And there's no defined or standardized integration between a help desk and a zero trust system. But yet, it's still a really important integration that platforms need to provide and that <clears throat> organizations as are looking to implement zero trust should look for. Interesting, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the ID system because for many agencies, even in the cloud era, the Active Directory is still the main repository of ID information for employees or possibly even other people from outside that interact as if they were employees. I'm talking about contractors on site. Mm -hmm. And so is Active Directory still part of what you integrate in here? Does that still matter uh, in a zero trust sense? Is it up to the task, I guess I'm asking? Yeah, it is. So Active Directory, kind of the classic Active Directory, if you will, is Microsoft product that's deployed on premises and managed by the enterprise. And what Microsoft has done is they've given organizations a pathway to move up to a, a cloud-based system. So they have, you can run Active Directory up in the cloud, uh, or you could utilize what was called Azure AD, which is uh, basically Microsoft managed cloud-based version of that. In all cases, functionally, it serves the same purpose, which is a repository for identities, a mechanism for authenticating, and uh, uh, a storage area for mapping and controlling groups and role memberships. And the way that, the reason that's important is not just of course for authentication and for lifecycle management, but for taking those attributes and group memberships and tying them into zero trust access policies, which is kind of the, the, the foundation of how organizations should be approaching zero trust. If you're in a directory group called 
marketing, you should probably be allowed to get access to resources that are tagged as marketing. If I'm not in marketing, if I'm in engineering, I shouldn't get access to resources that are tagged as marketing. And the idea of zero trust, though, seems to indicate a slightly more fine-grained approach to that. So even everyone within marketing, for example, wouldn't be able to access what the chief marketing officer, for example, could access. Yes. Or that person might be able to access things outside of marketing, whereas the people below him or her could only access what's in marketing, that type of thing. And exactly. That and, and that's one of the reasons that zero trust, we often talk about a zero trust journey, which is that organizations, as they get these capabilities in place, <clears throat> want and need to start to enforce finer and finer grain policies. So very clearly, it's everyone in marketing shouldn't get access to exactly the same things. There's probably some resources that everyone in marketing should access, and then some things that are going to be segregated even further by role. And the core of Zero Trust is also utilizing context around an individual user and their device, geolocation, for example, the status of their security posture on that device. And all those things are inputs or ingredients into the policy engine that then looks at this and says, OK, Tom is working from home today, and he's on a BYOD, but it has a corporate certificate. Sounds pretty good. We'll probably let him in and get access to this. But you know what? He's trying to access this higher value resource. We want to enforce step up authentication because he's, he's, you know, there's a number of factors that go into that consideration. And the implication here I'm ga gathering is that you need some automation to be able to have this happen because in an organization of, say, a large federal agency with 100, 200,000 people, there's no way you can fine tune this thing day by day, hour by hour, which it actually has to have, though. That's right. That's right. And that's um, another really important differentiator between the philosophy and the, the approach that, that organizations are taking with Zero Trust. And we'll call it pretty traditional security solution. So if you look at something like a VPN, for example, the VPNs are very static, and they tend to uh, be implemented in a way that grant users very, very broad network access. And that's a big problem. We've seen you know, time and time again that adversaries are able to take advantage of that. And the dynamic nature of zero trust combined with the fine-grained access can result in a very resilient organization and much, much better security. But it has to be associated with the automated capability of the system to adapt because manual systems and manual processes clearly are not going to be able to keep up with the scale and the speed that we need today. And even within a given set of permissions, there must be some dynamism. I'm thinking, for example, I have access here to a certain drive, to a sales drive, even though I'm not in the sales department. But I need the access, so I have it through the VPN. But I only go to the same subdirectory over and over and over again every single time. If I, as a user, suddenly started rooting through all of the other subdirectories and users that I have access to, could a system flag that and say, wait a minute, this is an anomaly even for someone with root permissions in that particular directory, that the system could account for that in a zero trust way and say, you know, stop it until someone can check it out. It's, <clears throat> that's a great example uh, and, and a great scenario. It's, there's very clearly uh, multiple components and multiple functions that make up an enterprise security model. And zero trust is broad enough to inc incorporate much of that in, in, into its architecture and its approach. Uh, and there's also a recognition that to do something like that requires integration across multiple vendor solutions. And that's okay, right? Organizations understand that they're going to need to tie these things together. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon us as an industry to make it easier to do that. So the scenario I mentioned is a terrific one because you could imagine that you or maybe some malware on your device <clears throat> starts doing something anomalous and starting to enumerate all of these subdirectories where you've never visited before. Clearly, maybe your networking system or your endpoint management system um, or some other element of the system should probably flag this as anomalous and something should happen as a result. Maybe someone, some human being gets an alert. Probably what should also happen is the zero trust system should get notified of this and do something. Maybe it warns you, maybe it blocks that network access temporarily until it gets resolved. But the key is now you have this, this, this nervous system, if you will, which can respond to this and take action in a way that's not destructive because you're not you know, removed from the network permanently, but you have a temporary blockage taking place until there's uh, some investigation that can take place and evaluate, okay, 
is this allowed or is something really malicious happening? We'll see if I can get into that drive the next there time I go. try, sure. And um, that gets to your third point, though, which is the organizational monitoring and management. At some point, an alert has to be for a real human being in order to intervene if that's necessary. And that's part of that third point there of, of the uh, management and governance of the whole zero trust. It is. And one of the biggest problems, of course, that security and network operations centers have is the signal to noise ratio. And a lot of what Zero Trust does is by enforcing the principle of least privilege and restricting users' network access to the absolute minimum, it makes it so that there's very little noise on the network. And if, if unexpected activity or attempted unexpected activity happens, that's a pretty clear signal that something malicious is happening that should be investigated. And how is Zero Trust, as we've described it, different from earlier approaches such as the uh, Defense Department's Comply to Connect C2C, other things we've had deployed over the years and decades, really. So Zero Trust is, uh, really builds on some solid foundations that have been put in place over the past few years and even over the past few decades. It's, Zero Trust is not about <clears throat> throwing away anything, well, maybe throw away your VPN, but not about throwing away wholesale, you know, well-run and uh, valuable components, like Comply to Connect is a great example of that. Um, that has value, less value now in a, in a world where people are remote, uh, but it doesn't mean that it should be gotten rid of. What Zero Trust is all about is, is taking together and integrating with all of these elements of a security and ecosystem and bringing forward, forward the ones that make sense to bring forward, um, getting rid of the ones that, do, that don't, or at least diminishing the friction that they cause, and then tying this together in a unified policy model that works uh, uh, in, a, in a unified way, regardless of whether a user is in an office today or working from home, and regardless of whether the resources that they're trying to access is in a, a government-managed data center or up in a cloud environment. That is um, what I think is different about Zero Trust, is it takes, from the start, a holistic, unified approach to help simplify security configuration and security operations. And aside from the executive order, why now for the federal government? I would say that the stakes have never been higher and the threat landscape has never been worse. And we clearly see that both on, on the government side and the private sector side. Um, it's terrific it, from my perspective to see the type of leadership that the federal government has taken. If you look at the zero trust work that's coming out of NIST and OMB and CISA, CISA and DHS, um, they've really done a lot to uh, promote this approach uh, and to take a, a very open uh, approach to this, soliciting feedback from the public and, you know, and adapting and listening. All right, we're going to get into some more detail on federal implementation. Right now, we're going to take a short break. My guest today is Jason Garbus. He's the chief product officer for AppGate. I'm Tom Temin. This discussion is what zero trust means for the federal government, sponsored by AppGate here on Federal News Network.